Welcome to Future of London's Achieving Net Zero Conference Week. I'm Nicola Mathers, Chief Executive of Future of London. If you're new to us, we are an independent network supporting those working in planning, housing, regeneration and economic development. Each year we put on a major insights programme and 2020 is no different. Thanks to the support of our sponsors, Arup, Landsec, Montague Evans and Pollard Thomas Edwards Architects, we're bringing you a series of events looking at how the public and the private sector can work together to achieve net zero. This year, for obvious reasons, we're hosting our first ever digital conference, but our online webinars and workshops, as always, will bring you practical examples, lively debates, opportunities to meet new people and inspiring food for thought from across London, the UK and overseas. While obviously we're sad not to see you in person, this one advantage of having a digital conference is we can invite many more people. So please do share the events you're joining with your colleagues. I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand over to Anna, who's our Head of Knowledge, who's gonna tell you about what our conference week has in store for you. Thanks, Nicola. Hi everyone, I'm Anna, Head of Knowledge at Future of London, and I'm running the Achieving Net Zero programme. And I'd like to give you a very quick snapshot of what we have planned in the upcoming week. On Tuesday the 27th of October, we're going to be talking about behaviour change. Join us at 9.30 to, dis to discuss what councils, communities, contractors and consultants can do in order to embed holistic net zero thinking and behaviours. On Wednesday the 28th of October at 4, we have an international panel who will be exploring how we can fund net zero. And importantly, they'll be debating the cost of action versus the cost of inaction. And on Thursday, the 29th of October, we'll be running an interactive workshop exploring the practical steps required to deliver London's green recovery. We invite you to join us for this at 12.30. It'll be an hour and a half of provocations, small group discussions and a chance to meet other digital delegates. If you miss any of the content this week, don't worry, we're making recordings of all sessions and these will be available on Friday, the 30th of October. To find out more about this week's events, or the programme in general, please do visit our website and I look forward to seeing you at the various events this week. And now to kickstart Digital Conference Week and to fire up your imaginations, please keep watching to see seven brilliant net zero ideas for the future from our future London leaders and Leaders Plus graduates. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Peter Watkins and I'm an architect and associate at Paul Thomas Edwards. And my proposal is a roof plan for London, a desktop platform to enable local authorities to evaluate and prioritise sustainable and community-based rooftop interventions on their existing housing stock. Thank you, Tata. The climate crisis and recent pandemic have demonstrated the need for greater efforts to combat flash flooding raising temperatures and limited availability of open space and places for the community to meet and gather. Recent months have highlighted the inflexibility of in existing accommodation to support home working and provide sufficient amenity space for young people to play. And older buildings continue for many to be unaffordable to heat. Meanwhile, as development in London continues apace, tensions remain between meeting these challenges and using the precious available space for new homes and infrastructure. But what if there is an existing untapped resource, acres of unused space that is spread across every borough in London? Whilst current guidelines cater for rooftops of new developments and ensure ecological and environmental measures are delivered, the vast quantity of buildings which predate rooftop guidance sit underutilised. In 2004, developer Goldcrest Homes completed Angelus Apartments in Islington with the enticing offer of 2,600 square feet of communal terrace for yoga and Pilates. I was sold, I moved in, and fast forward 15 years, that same space sits empty except for some abandoned garden furniture. And it was this that sparked my proposal for London. Airspace development has seen significant funding in recent years as part of the multi-headed approach to tackling the housing crisis. Multiple studies conducted between 2016 and 19 estimates rooftop capacity for anywhere between 130 and 180,000 new homes in London. But with the barriers of planning, structural capacity and cost, that promise has not been delivered. 
However, every empty roof can offer an opportunity for one of multiple responses to meet the other critical challenges we face. Within a kilometre of that empty roof terrace in Islington, there are 35 local authority or housing association sites where rooftop interventions could occur. Where investment in rooftop housing opportunities had a single focus, a roof plan for London looks at all opportunities, ecological and environmental, energy generation, health and community. Individually, these are not new concepts. However, the framework for finding and assessing sites and then implementing them in a holistic way in volume is. Roof Plan London is a desktop platform which employs a decision tea approach to analyzing a local authority's roof space portfolio. Based on the information provided by the development team and harnessing existing data resources, the platform guides the user through to the viable options available for each roof. In turn, the platform steers users away from costly options and risk to those interventions most suitable for the roof in question. This reduces the decision-making process down and eliminates risky and unviable options before the need for site visits or costly surveys. The platform then collates and categorizes the sites by development potential across the whole portfolio. Through the platform, roofs with safe access and balustrading will be highlighted as opportunities for community-based use, providing much needed outdoor space. Others will be flagged for ecological interventions, rainfall management and PV panels, providing the opportunity to generate electricity and combat fuel poverty. And by consolidating similar opportunities and sites, the local authority mitigate the bespoke nature of rooftop projects through their large portfolios and they bring in an economy of scale which is attractive to contractors and can utilise existing supply chains, such as the GLA's retrofit and urban greening programmes. Alongside sustainable or ecological infrastructure, this platform will also highlight spaces suitable for community groups and social uses. Crowdfund London is actively seeking creative responses to unused spaces, which will benefit the whole local community, spaces which are currently in short supply. I propose an initial rollout across a single London borough, focused on their residential apartment block portfolio. Following this pilot, post-project evaluations can feed back into the project's uh, question and decision tree matrix, ready for rolling out across all local authorities and housing associations. Roof Plan London looks to fill in the void in airspace development, tackling the hundreds of rooftops unsuitable for residential development, but primed for smaller strategic interventions. Wi-Fi enabled roof spaces for home working, energy generation to feed homes and electric car clubs, additional outdoor space for healthy play away from the polluted streets below. And what a future needs the platform could address? With drone deliveries and electric um, and even people, online commerce will need landing points across the capital, welcoming people and products via concierges in the sky. And whilst it is hoped that new developments will bring change through current regulations, a successful future will need both new and existing roof spaces to come together to address all the challenges we face as a city. Thank you very much. Thanks everyone for coming today, albeit virtually. Um, my name is Will Bradley. I work in the transport team at the Greater London Authority. And as you can see, my proposal for London is titled Four Wheels Bad, Two or Three Much Better, How Cargo Bikes Can Save Our City. Okay. I'd like everyone to shut their eyes and think back through all the deliveries that you've had at home during lockdown. How many were made by van and how many were made by cargo bike? I'd hazard a guess that your answers were a lot followed by zero. You can open your eyes now. So my proposal for London is to shift this balance to accelerate a move from carbon intensive vans to net zero compatible cargo bikes. I propose to pilot this in the city of London alongside the car-free area being created in response to coronavirus. So why do we need a shift from vans to bikes? Freight is absolutely critical to the smooth functioning of cities. Bricks need to be taken to construction sites, beer needs to be delivered to pubs, and bins need to be emptied from our homes. But the volume and types of vehicles that currently dominate our streets pose a range of serious problems. They contribute to poor air quality, large vehicles are dangerous, and transport is responsible for over a quarter of our greenhouse gas emissions. Road transport is the largest emitter of carbon, 
with vans one of only two modes where emissions have actually increased since 1990. Whilst vehicles have become more efficient, this has been offset by their increased use. My proposal seeks to reverse this trend. Vans clog up our streets in a physical sense too. A strong economy, at least until recently, with more buildings being built and then requiring servicing and changing online shopping habits have all contributed to a rise in van traffic over recent years. This has caused serious congestion, a huge economic burden. London does have a strategy to make freight safer, cleaner and more efficient, but an area that has not received enough focus is shifting last mile deliveries from vans to cargo bikes. In the debate about the future of our cities, in my opinion, too much hope is placed in new technology, such as self-driving cars, when a better solution has been around for decades. Whilst battery technology has improved the cargo bike, not that much has really changed. They are still incredibly efficient machines for moving heavy loads around congested city centres. A cargo trike can carry up to half the load of a small van, but with less than a tenth of the annual running costs. No parking tickets, no fuel, no congestion charge. One courier company has found that a cargo bike can average three times as many drops a day compared to a van. So despite having half the carrying capacity, you have three times the efficiency and just a tenth of the costs. So it starts to look not just like a good decision for the climate, but also for a, business, for a good business decision too. More and more firms are trialing cargo bikes, such as Royal Mail and Sainsbury's, but it has at times felt more like a PR decision than a genuine business decision. And with coronavirus reshaping how people move around our city, most notably in the city of London, now is the time to think seriously about shifting from vans as access for motor vehicles is squeezed. With the street changes the stick, my proposal will use a handful of carrots to help organisations make the shift with a focus on three key areas. Firstly, I propose equalising the government funding available to buy cargo bikes and electric cars. Whilst grants are available for cargo bikes, they're not yet at a level needed to stimulate the scale of the shift that we need to achieve net zero. Electric car subsidies are still huge, but more cars on our streets is not going to help us achieve net zero and is not going to deal with some of those other issues that we're facing, such as congestion, such as road danger, and even air quality because of all the associated emissions with uh, brake wear and tyre wear. Secondly, with more funding available from the government, I would use an existing network of healthy streets officers to reach out and work directly with service providers, such as facilities managers and estates teams, to help them navigate the knotty details of shifting from vans to bikes. This would obviously include helping them access this government funding and tackling issues such as where to store a cargo bike at night. And thirdly, my proposal would bring forward plans for last mile logistics hubs, making use of underutilized buildings in the city, of which there may be a few more in the, in the years to come. These hubs work by massively increasing the efficiency of deliveries. Parcels are brought to the hub in a full lorry or a van, preferably electric, and then sorted for onward delivery by a cargo bike. The DPD hub pictured here helped to reduce parcel miles by 50%. So bikes are not going to replace every van journey in London, but by shifting some journeys onto two or three wheels, my proposal will start to bring down carbon emissions in a sector where they have been rising, and whilst also helping to make London a more livable city. So thank you all for listening, and I'm looking forward to answering your questions about how to get your organisation to shift to cargo bikes. Good morning everyone, my name is Charlene Goodkill and I'm a land manager at Catalyst. I'm here today to present to you my proposal for London, Green Gauge. Together we can make a difference. Thank you, Sefa. Could this be our future London, soon to become hotter and drier? It's anticipated that by 2050, the average summer will be three degrees warmer and heat waves more likely. In contrast, winters will be milder, but wetter. London will also be affected by sea levels rising. Over the next century, current projections see sea level rise in the terms of 20 to 90 centimetres. This is due to thermal expansion of the oceans and melting glaciers and polar ice. For the Thames estuary, this could be an increase of 2.7 metres,
which would lead to a significant risk of flooding. So what are we doing? The progress we have made to date has mostly come from effects that have not involved customers change, consumers changing their behaviour, notably decarbonisation of electricity supply. This graph shows that we need to speed up. Latest studies show that CO2 emissions were 30.3 billion tonnes, which was a 33% reduction on 1990 levels. You're probably wondering what the relationship is between net zero and a one tonne black rhino. So that you can visualise how much CO2 we are each individually responsible for, on average, in London, it's the equivalent of 3.4 black rhinos. And with COVID-19, this figure will now have dropped. Overall, there have been improvements, but we are not moving quickly enough. And at this rate, target will, targets will be missed. There's a lot that the government and industries can do to contribute to net zero. But with 9.3 million people living in London, there's even more opportunity to change. Right now, hand to hand, together we can make a difference. Everyone has the power to make a decision and every decision we make has an impact on carbon. So this is my solution, Green Gauge. A free app de designed to enable users to reduce their carbon footprint by making more informed everyday choices. From the energy we use at home, the transport modes we take and the products we buy, our many small decisions add up to a massive impact on our planet. Not many people truly understand their own carbon footprint or the impact of making small changes that can make big differences. For example, the choice to commute to work by car or by taking public transport, purchasing local versus imported produce. So what does the app do? The app helps, track, um, the, the help, the app helps users track their carbon footprint by tracking transport, food and energy usage. Users will also be able to set monthly targets, which will in turn help reduce energy bills. The app will use coloured gauges to present users their daily, monthly and weekly carbon footprint within different sectors and help them understand their impact. There will also be a green gauge community where users can share sustainable ideas with like-minded individuals, compete and compare with other users in their neighbourhood, build loyalty by earning points and in turn get rewarded. The rewards could be local shop and restaurant discounts or vouchers, perhaps um, a discounted gym membership, and this will in turn support local businesses. The data collected could potentially be used by local authorities to show them how their residents are performing and help drive their action towards climate change. So how does the app work? Well, the data, a lot of the data is already widely available. When users download the app, they'll have an opportunity to connect to their smart meter and there'll also be an, a questionnaire when you start up the app. This will include general questions and initial questions surrounding a user's, user's energy usage, such as how do you get to work? Do you recycle? In the future, the app might be able to connect to cars and other transport modes directly. Daily Green Gauge will check in and remind users of their energy performance. The app will show you a happy, mediocre or sad face. A study by Kingston University on behaviour change found that something as simple as a smiley face can impact a person's decision greatly. And this may help encourage users to keep the app happy. A sad face will appear when targets have been missed or users have made a significant decision that results in high level of carbon emissions. This could be something such as a long haul flight. To change this face back to green, a user will need to make changes to their lifestyle as soon as possible or they'll have the opportunity to contribute to local net zero charities or tree planting charities. I propose to roll this app starting with a sing I, I propose to roll out this app starting with a single local authority. With almost with at least 26 boroughs having now declared climate emergency, I truly believe the app would be benefit not only our impact on carbon, but local authorities fight against climate change. This is my proposal for London and to you. Green Gauge, an app designed to enable users to reduce their carbon footprint by making more informed everyday choices. Together we can make a difference. Thank you for listening. Good morning. Uh, my name's Felicity Scott. I work in the accidents team at Poplar Harker. And this is my proposal called Closed Loops and Co-location, maximizing industrial land for multiple gains. Thank you, Safa. So I start then by inviting you to reconsider the value of your morning cup of coffee or glass of orange juice. And in doing so, I believe we can solve two problems. 
Firstly, by supporting innovation in biotechnology, we can maximise our food waste and we can reduce emissions and pressures on natural resources. And secondly, we can overcome the challenges posed by industrial intensification and co-location with residential. So looking at this lovely pile of rotting food, it might not seem that it is of much value, and I'll come to that in a moment. But we know that a third of our food goes into landfill, and when it does, it produces methane, contributing 11% of our greenhouse gases. So the time to act is now. A recent report showed that on our current trajectory, the UK will miss its 2050 target of low zero net emissions. This means we are facing a tangible risk of irreversible and catastrophic climate change. So we need progress across all of our sectors and a rapid decarbonisation of our economy. It's crucial then that we get to the source of the problem and reduce surplus wherever possible. But there will always be unavoidable food waste, such as our coffee grinds or our orange peels. So what can we do here? Centralised composting and anaerobic digestion are already in place and are excellent parts of the solution. But I believe it's possible to reuse our food waste for a higher value. So we need to accelerate the shift to a circular economy, eliminating waste and ensuring that natural resources remain in use for longer. Biotechnology allows us to do this. We can maximise the value extracted from food byproducts. We can reduce dependency on natural resources and we can promote sustainable production. In the UK, clean growth through biotechnology contributes 220 billion to the economy and 5.2 million jobs. And it's a sector that's growing. Here we see BioBean who uh, reuse coffee grinds on a large scale, producing products for biomass energy, logs and pellets, therefore reducing our need for coal. And in London, there's already wide sector support for this. Uh, the London Waste and Recycling Board run an accelerator programme. One such company, Biome, pictured here, take food waste, including our lovely orange, to produce construction materials that are 100% biodegradable. Um, and they reduce the need for other resources. But recently, Biome were looking for space within the capital to upscale their manufacturing. Um, they were unable to find the space and move to Somerset. And this brings us to the second problem, and that's land. These businesses need space and we need to think of scale because this is an opportunity to process our waste here in the capital and reduce the transport miles. But our land is under great pressure for losing its industrial land so we can meet our housing targets. So my proposal is that we could use sites like this. Now, it may go against perceived logic and if it looked anything like this, I think we'd all agree it'd be inappropriate. But through great design, it's possible to place clean biotechnologies alongside our homes. And here we have the GLA's industrial intensification planning guidelines that show that it is absolutely possible to overcome the challenges faced by mixed developments. Here we see in blue industrial and yellow residential, so the stacking to make efficient use of space. These businesses are clean, so we can further design out any noise or air pollution and we can ensure an active frontage, maybe through retail offer of the products produced. Making the financial stack up is essential, especially around the rent of a large industrial space. So we may need a very uh, creative uh, development partner who shares in this vision because these businesses are producing products for the market and for profit. But we might also want to think about creative use of the community infrastructure levy. And of course, we need our communities on board, those that live around it and those who want to invite to come and live here. In onshore wind developments, which have always been unpopular, we've been able to overcome nimbyism by um, employing social justice principles to share the benefits and offer things like community ownership models, which I think would be a really great opportunity for us to do so here. And here is my proposed potential site. It's in Tower Hamlets, it sits alongside A12, and it's a currently designated waste management site and has been a real sticking point for redevelopment for many years now. I feel Tower Hamlets especially would be a great place for a pilot scheme because they set a precedent by being one of the first boroughs to announce a climate emergency. And because it's already a designated waste management site, I think they could utilise their waste apportionment also to make it viable. And who else could make this opportunity grow? 
I think as long as we're, we're working with universities, we will have that steady pipeline of new innovative technologies. And the GLA would be on board to help de-risk the development through equity investment. So the idea is simple. If we start supporting the scaling up of biotechnology innovations, we can process our food waste here in the capital and reduce pressures on natural resources. And this clean technology makes it possible to co-locate it with residential, releasing land for homes without undermining London's industrial needs. So it's an invitation firstly to Tower Hamlets, but to all local authorities to consider use of their waste apportionment for this project. Thank you very much. Hello everybody, uh, my name is Mike Bottomley, I'm a senior planner for Tibbalds and my idea um, involves around bike lane to London and increasing cycling uh, as a modal share. I'm ready for everything to presentation to start. There is not a single city in the world where private vehicles are effective as the primary mode of transport. I believe we can live in a healthy and happy city by moving towards cycling as a primary mode of transport. This modal change will need a significant cultural change, but I believe that it is possible. And to encourage this cultural shift in London, uh, I'm proposing a toolkit of infrastructure to quickly and cheaply install temporary bike lanes at the local level to make cycling accessible to all. I started developing this idea prior to the pandemic, but the Mayor's Street Space plan to encourage active travel has made my proposals uh, even more relevant and timely. Given the climate emergency, accelerating the uptake of zero carbon transport is critical and I have uh, identified two main problems to overcome. Firstly, uh, to increase the uptake of cycling, um, high quality bike lanes need to be in place. Unless a seven year old and a 77 year old can safely use a bike lane that isn't safe or accessible to all. And secondly, to build high quality bike lanes, we often need to overcome significant political opposition um, that bike lanes in London have faced in the past. And my proposals will reduce the political and financial capital uh, required to install bike lanes. Although cycling is gaining in popularity, um, there is still a perception that it is uh, only for the young and the brave, and increasing the diversity of people cycling is critical. Decades of experience in countries like the Netherlands and Denmark has shown that if you build high quality bike lanes, um, segregated from other road vehicles, then people will use them. This ubiquity means that people use bike, bikes to make everyday journeys, including the school run, shopping, uh, commuting, and other local journeys, uh, because these locations are connected with safe bike lanes. These linked local journeys are often overlooked when planning transport and are the type of journeys that are more regularly carried out by women. So local bike lanes can help address gender inequality and access to affordable transport. My Lanes for London proposal is to create a simple toolkit of three physical elements that can be deployed quickly and cheaply and flexibly. The first element is lane dividers to create a clear distinction between the vehicle highway and the cycle highway. These would create a separation of space and enforce a sense of security for those cycling. Uh, parklets on a movable unit the size of the standard car parking space um, to install in existing car parking spaces. And uh, cycle racks, also on a unit the size of a car parking, of a parking space. Um, and these can be put in place at key nodes such as outside of schools and shops um, to encourage the use of bikes for short trips. Uh, I am proposing that this simple set of elements can be designed and manufactured in London. And since there are only three components, uh, this will reduce the cost of implementation, uh, but still allow for a great deal of flexibility. Uh, the lane elements can be installed quickly, um, rather than disrupting roads for months on end uh, with permanent infrastructure, the temporary lanes can be set out in a matter of days to minimize disruption. And my intention is that the lane elements can work in conjunction with programs being rolled out, rolled out by London boroughs part, as part of the Street Space Initiative, and can help bridge the gap between the temporary schemes being put in place now uh, which often use traffic cones or very temporary infrastructure and permanent bike lanes in the future. The temporary nature uh, means that it can be used on a trial basis and if it doesn't work for a particular area it can easily be moved elsewhere. Equally um, if it does prove to be a success the elements will be robust enough to be left in place for years. This means that if a local scheme is successful it could be expanded and ultimately turned into a permanent bike lane once the demand and public support is established. I've created this idea so that it is easily scalable and adaptable, uh, meaning that it can be used to meet the needs of different organisations and programmes. And I envision coming, funding coming from a variety of various sources, including a SIL contributions for transport infrastructure and the TFL Special Fund for Cycleways. Equally, uh, it can be used to help implement existing schemes that, are already, that already have funding. One of the most important elements of my proposal 
is that the temporary bike lanes can be deployed at a local level and complement the strategic network of bike, lane, of bike lanes. A primary school would be an ideal hub uh, to focus a temporary bike lane around since they generally have a small catchment and ideal journeys for parents cycling with young children. The limited catchment means that two or three key routes could be provided with approximately 1.5 kilometres of uh, temporary infrastructure. The school and parents could easily be engaged uh, to build support for the scheme and groups of children could paint the dividers to create a sense of ownership and community. So, in conclusion, a significant modal, share, uh, a modal shift to zero carbon transport is critical to address the climate emergency and my proposal for London will help accelerate this process by quickly delivering bike lanes and make cycling accessible to all Londoners. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, my name's Aisha Lacey and I'm a development manager at Hammersmith and Britain Council. Thank you for being the group who will help London become carbon neutral by 2030. I know it's a big job, but if we don't start tackling the issue today, it will only become harder. We have an exciting 10 years ahead of us, so let's work together starting now. 22% of UK carbon emissions come from homes. London has more than three and a half million homes and needs 66,000 more each year to meet demand. With London Council's building more homes, my focus is on them using their planning, spending and commissioning powers to decarbonise the building industry. A 2020 UK-wide Guardian survey found that 47% of councils didn't have a carbon reduction strategy. But London councils can lead the way by using existing planning powers. Simply put, every new London home should meet the 2030 target and this should become a London-wide planning condition. An interesting fact, homes that meet the passive house standard are so energy efficient that you can heat them using only the toaster in your kitchen. The image in the bubble is from the Agar Grove Estate, a flagship resident-led project developed by Camden Council. This is a passive house accredited scheme, showing how to do it on a large scale in the city. When commissioning a new build project, Make sure that everyone involved, both internal and external, understand the net zero vision. And across the team, make sure the right mix of knowledge, skills and experience is brought to the table. Also include an energy consultant so that carbon testing and benchmarking are core to the process. The public sector accounts for 25% of all UK construction procurement. We should be using this, these spending powers to bring carbon reduction to the fore in all projects. Areas to include um, are transportation of materials, tapping into local supply chains and minimising construction waste. Generally, contractors are still in a discovery phase, working out how best to maximise the amount of sustainable materials used, also looking at ways to reduce, reuse and recycle waste and cutting down on transport. Councils have to ensure that what's designed and agreed on paper is what's delivered on site. We all agree that bringing residents on board early is a good idea. As users of the homes we build, residents can tell us what they need and we can help them manage their carbon footprint starting now. Getting them ready for their new energy efficient homes. Handover is the point when residents learn about the technology in their new homes, how to use them efficiently and how to care for them. Investing time here will make the new home experience a better one and will manage future maintenance costs. Developers may have time and cost pressures, but this is not something to rush through. So, we should be asking ourselves a few questions. Do councils and professionals have a shared vision and knowledge? Is there an early adopter or pioneer we can learn from? Do we have enough time to experiment? What will the impact of Brexit be? And how can we pay for this? At Hamsmith and Fulham, we've begun adding carbon reduction costs into our project expenditure plans. With budgets already under pressure for all councils, we'll have to be creative. The land value contribution that councils bring has a big role in making schemes work. And this may mean councils being ready to accept market sale 
as a part of our schemes. By working in partnership, GLA and central government funding would help get pilot schemes up and running. Other measures could help the wider housing market become more green, such as council tax bandings taking account of energy efficiency and stamp duty incentives for greener homes, eventually showing the way for the private sector to follow. T minus 10 years, we'd better get cracking. With other issues to deal with like Brexit and COVID-19, we should expect that it will take a couple of years to build consensus and maybe another couple of years to build a skills base that we will need and at the scale that we're going to need them. The second half of the decade is when we've got to deliver. We're still learning how COVID will change our needs and how we will use our homes in the future. Living, working and commuting patterns may change and our energy footprint might move away from offices towards homes we'll need to adapt to a new normal and rebuild better. Next steps. First of all, let's celebrate. 26 out of 33 London councils have signed up to the Climate Emergency Declaration. Let's update our external comms and partner contracts. Let's set the right goals and targets for our teams and let's meet in a year's time to see how far we've come. Thank you. I'm Monique Wallace. I, I work for the planning uh, I work as a planning manager for the strategic housing team in Lewisham. So netzero.com is a collaborative approach to delivering net zero homes. It's a community in the form of an online portal accessible in all formats. The portal contains everyone and everything relating to the delivery of net zero homes with the focus on small sites, small businesses, simplicity and accessibility. Pollution levels have significantly reduced because of the COVID lockdown, but in reality, London was still breaking up EU particulate limits in January this year. In 2017, approximately two and a half million households were in fuel poverty. We need to build more net zero homes to minimise fuel poverty and to reduce pollution from and into homes. The utilities cabinets in the right of the image show the growth of homelessness between 2010 and 2015. The draft London plan has set a target for the delivery of about 650,000 new homes over the next 10 years, of which 250,000 of those homes should be delivered through small sites. The images here associate carbon neutral homes with high value fancy architecture. If small sites were to deliver new homes at net zero, that would go a long way to contributing to the government's 2050 net zero target. But net zero homes can come at significant premium. I suggest there currently isn't a system cohesive enough to achieve the economies of scale needed to make the delivery of net zero homes a realistic target, which currently appear to be at the expense of maximum housing delivery. Net zero homes must be financially viable as must be as financially viable as achieving Part L building regulations. The ambition is to make net zero the new normal for small sites. The portal will include a register of small builders and businesses. It will highlight partnering opportunities and forums to discuss the building challenges. Specialised frameworks will be used to ensure that fixed fees, necessary skills and obligations are captured in any appointment, saving significant time with the procurement process. Individual plot owners, neighbours, community land trusts and councils would all register their sites. There'd be tools and assistance to encourage and the packaging of sites and jo with joint ventures. The sites would be advertised to small builders and businesses. There'd be templates and guidance for planning applications, streamlining the process for developers and planners alike, again, reducing time. There'd be a directory of plans and ideas for delivering net zero homes, fully costed case studies. If your site is the right dimension and orientation, you potentially could have the house that you're seeing now. It'd be a cut and paste form of housing delivery with alterations to suit the locations and maintain the element of individuality, whilst again reducing the time and cost of delivering the net zero homes. There'd be a library of real examples and case studies setting out the pros and cons about different building types and methods such as modular and cross laminated timber. There'd be an honesty log of previous successes and failures. Seven of the 104 award winning Goldsmith Street house, houses in Norwich did not achieve passive house certification. Materials recommended through the site would have been used on net zero homes previously, with further qualified materials also recommended. 
There'd be bulk purchase discounts to encourage collaborative working with other small businesses. Forums would share cheat ideas when they achieve the desired result at cheaper prices. The portal would form an extension to the GLA's existing small sites, small builders programme. Initially, GLA reps would suggest matching sites with builders and specialisms and experiences until algorithms from the portal would learn how to make those recommendations. Businesses would bid to work on projects after seeing the plots advertised on the site. And of course, the delivery of affordable housing will be encouraged. At first, additional grants must be offered for net zero homes to be delivered in volume. Affordable Rents Plus could capture the money saved through the reduced bills to help NPVs. There may be opportunities to reduce seal payments and Section 106 obligations, and employment and tra training contributions could be waived. The portal will comprise libraries that would also include relevant policies and legislation, pre-populated tender documents, clear explanations of passive house and other net zero accreditations, local labour opportunities for work experience, apprenticeships and volunteering. We'd need to engage everyone through the GLA to give the portal authentication. Councils will promote the portal through their small sites SPD using tax records. All small relevant businesses will be contacted, inviting them to register, as would all known small sites owners. With regard to money, for small businesses, the cut and paste plans and associated information will be licensed by the original architect, engineer or surveyor. The portal will be supported by advertising other net zero technologies, such as internal and external, external work uh, and electric vehicles. There will be a peppercorn registration fees for small, small businesses and higher fees for larger companies. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>